Welcome, everybody, to episode 136, Burrows and Burbs, season four. Before we dive into our discussion, I want to remind you of a couple couple details. First, I want you to visit our sponsor. I'm going to hit, let's see, share screen, show you what they're all about. Boom. Grace Farms. You'll find them at gracefarms.org. And that's it. I want to bring your attention to on May 4th with every fiber grand opening. They're going to have talks about the new long term exhibit about um, the design for freedom movement. And that aims to inspire understanding about the materials that make up the built environment around us. So you can learn more about that at gracefarms.org and you can support their mission with Grace Farms teas and coffee. And you can find those at sharegracefarms.com. Today, episode 136, we're talking about the American Real Estate Association. Advocating, innovating, educating. Isn't it time you traded up? What the heck does that mean? We're going to find out because we've got saber rattling Haber rattling Jason Haber on the show today. And he is coming for NAR. And with coming that, in hot. Coming for NAR. <clears throat> there he is, right on cue. Hey Jason, say hi. And Hello, why don't everyone. you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because all we know is that you're a saber rattler. So I actually, and I actually disagree with the uh <laughs> I, I think I'm more of a consensus builder, but um, but I'll leave the headlines for for others. So you know, we I've been in, in that's, real that's estate. That's how they. That's how the real deal sells papers. Yes, they have to sell papers. But I, I actually thought it was a good. I can, I, was, can I just oh, preface? Can I just preface? I've known Jason for a long time, running around Manhattan. Long he time. Is a very intelligent, very thoughtful person. So I'm very interested to see what he's got to say. Thank you. I should just shut up now, actually. I'm way ahead. <laughs> no, come on. I'm going to test you. I can only go downhill. So, you know, we, um, I got involved. I've been in an agent in New York for 17 years. And as you guys know, in New York, we're not members of NAR. So we have very little connectivity to what happens over there. But a year ago, I also got licensed in Florida. And I work with a lot of clients in South Florida as well as as New York. And so I, I'm a very new NAR agent. And I guess that mattered a little bit in context of what happened. Um, on October, uh, sorry, on August 31st, August 26th, the New York Times did a story uh, about sexual harassment at the National Association of, of Realtors, rampant sexual harassment. And I read the story like everyone else, um, Saturday morning. And... I read the story and said, okay, well, this, the guy with 29 accusations and it was, it was so over the top. I was like, he'll be gone by midday, right? And I ignored it. I like put the story down, even think about it again. But as the day went on and I started looking online and I saw the story was getting no traction. I was like, this is a little weird. Like, why is no one, where are the brokerages where are the state boards and associations like where is everyone where is everyone on this and everyone was silent and i was just now, like this wait is before you go on why do you suppose that is do you think that we're all don't care or do you think that we are intimidated by nar so i can tell you at the time i had no idea what the answer was in retrospect i found out that there was a lot of intimidation that no one wanted to be off sides no one wanted to cross NAR. What we don't realize in New York is that NAR is the biggest trade association in the United States of America. NAR is the biggest political contributor in the United States of America. NAR takes in $350 million a year in revenue, according to their last 994, the biggest trade association in the country. And crossing them, no one wanted to do. Now, being that I was so new as a member, because I just got licensed in South Florida, I had no idea. I had no idea how big they were. I kept calling them the NRA for the first few days because I like <laughs> I couldn't get like NAR, NRA. I was like, I was like, you know, 
Um, so like I was, I was really came from a point of in many ways sort of ignorance, but no one was speaking. So, you know, I just put out a couple of comments on Twitter X for on day one. You know, I retweeted a few things. And then on Sunday, I said, wait, this is, this is nuts. Like no one's saying anything. So I created an online petition calling for the then president of NAR to resign. And the petition gathered some speed and momentum. Two days later, he was gone. Okay. So I was done, right? Like the guy who was accused of harassment is leaving. I did my little, little, little part and I can move on. The New York Times on writing about his resignation covered my petition. And that was how my name sort of got out there a little bit in the public square on this. And instead of that being the end of my advocacy, it turned out to be the start of my advocacy. And it was the start because that day women started to reach out to me from around the country, all over, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, New York, Virginia, Maryland, California, Portland. And they all had stories of sexual harassment, assault, rape. And their message was to keep going. And their message was that this former president of NAR wasn't the disease, he was the symptom of larger cultural rot. And I started to get private messages. I had to download all those, like the private messaging apps, Telegram and Signal. There were some people who to this day, um, who I still am in communication with are anonymous. I don't, I don't know who they are. I, I, I have, they have pseudonyms. So I decided to do more. And I didn't know what to do precisely, but I convened a group, a working group, about 20 people. Uh, some were NAR insiders, um, some were victims. And I said, what do we... What are the four things that they need to do now to reform? And we came up with a four point plan. We put it out there as a petition and we created a day of action where we protested and held a press conference with other elected officials and leaders in Chicago. And this was all in September. And we started to make strides. We called for some people to be, uh, to resign, retire, fired, whatever he was, just to leave. Well, let me just pause and, and make sure I understand. So um, you you file the petition and then you realize it's not just a petition about removing the individual. The individual isn't enough. We've got a problem with the right. organization. And from what I hear you saying, the organization at its core has got a culture problem. And what I'm hearing is it was arrogant. It's an arrogant, powerful organization and just removing the head of it wasn't going to change that. So when you're starting to make your four point plan, are you advocating for the reform or the replacement in your four point? Plan? No. So at this point, uh, and people were already coming to me saying you should start a trade association. I was like, no, man, you're crazy. No way. Uh, we were just doing reform. And so we focused on four a four point plan by uh, October three of the four points had been in some degree adopted. Uh, the one point that they never uh, made any changes to was the release of women from NDA, women who had, they had a, a system of one party NDA. So two, party, two parties are in a dispute and only one party had to sign the NDA. You can imagine which party that was. And so the, the problem with that structure is, is in this case, the man is free to go into the public square and declare his innocence and declare that those who are uh, spoken out against him are liars or whatever you want to say. But the, the other side, they're not allowed to speak because they're under contractual NDA. And so, and so I was advocating for that to be released and still am. I still haven't, haven't done that. But anyway... So to that point, making, though, your effectiveness in execution was fast. Very fast. Yeah. So, and we, this was sort of, we came out of nowhere, you know, I think, I think if NAR had come to me probably in like the first two weeks and said, hey, like, you're really making changes, like, join our board. Um, 
or we'd like to see you involved. They probably could have co-opted me. You know, oh, I get, oh, I'm on the board of NAR. Oh, look at me. Oh, I get to go to conferences and drink for free or whatever. So sure, like I I would have, um, I may have, I probably could have been had in the early days. I, I, there was no plan, right? This was all ad hoc. This was all one day at a time. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Like shooting from the hip. And so I have a political background. Um, Can you and, tell us about that a little bit? Just, just brief. Yeah. Just to- so, so um, I've, I've worked, uh, I've, I've held multiple positions in New York state um, in the democratic party in New York state from state committee, district leader, a delegate to the conventions. Um, I worked for a number of elected officials uh, in New York uh, I got my start in Washington, D.C. When I was in college, I worked for Lanny Davis, who at the time was special counsel to President Clinton. And so I, I have a background not only in, in public policy. I taught at um, at John Jay College for a number of years uh, after getting my master's degree from the International Affairs School at Columbia. And so in parallel to my real estate career, I've always been politically active and engaged, maybe more behind the scenes. So every, people didn't like know about it, but I, but you know, I, most of the electeds, a lot of the electeds in New York are, are good friends of mine, the state legislature and the city council and, and so on. And so I was using sort of the the skills of my sort of call it government, academia, uh, political background, media background, and putting them to use here. And like, we worked very quickly, to your point, like, we were making really good progress. And thousands of people had joined what we now were calling at the time the NAR Accountability Project. And I was <clears throat> kind of caught off guard um, at how fast we were making changes because like this was, you know, NAR is a very big organization. And, well, back uh, to the time timeline, you know, you put out your four point plan and and you've done so quickly and you're advocating for a reform and they don't respond at what point do you make the leap to say, um, let's replace, let's make a American real estate association so, instead of let's fix, the, let's fix them. I mean, let's say we just, uh, we can't fix them, but they become less relevant. Do we even need a NAR? Do we even need an American real estate association? A- A-R-E-A. Do we call you AREA or A-R-E-A? So we're just going by Amer- American REA. We're figuring out the an acronym, maybe American okay. REA. We're, we're, that's sort of a little lower on our on American our list Rhea. to figure that out. But maybe Amer- I like American REA. We'll see. We'll I see like we- American REA. Okay. We'll see so, where we end up landing. So at what point do you make the leap that we need a new one? So the leap came the day of the lawsuit verdict because NAR made very clear they were going to win. They were confident in victory. We got this. Instead, the verdict came down shorter than a flight from Palm Beach to LaGuardia Airport. Two hours and 25 minutes that jury was out. And so, and there was no break glass plan. Like, okay, we lost. Here's what you got to do now. Nothing. The industry was scrambling. And here we are months later, we're still scrambling with, you know, Zillow's trying to come up with a solution that was just announced yesterday, and all the firms are trying to figure this out. It's been messy since then. So after the lawsuit verdict came out, that was when things changed. Now, the lawsuit and the issues surrounding them are completely separate from the sexual harassment issues that I was working on. But in fact, they're inextricably linked because they both speak to an organizational rot within NAR. And they both speak to the deficiencies that come along the way. The organization had become very bloated over time, very bureaucratic. And by way of example, Apple has eight members of their board of directors. IBM has 12. Do you know how many members of the board of directors there are at the National Association of Realtors? Take a guess. No, nobody Throw knows. Throw out a number. 30. 30. Anyone else? Five. Five. Okay. 1,475. <laughs> I, I saw that. Look on their 994. That's not a board of directors. It's a Politburo. Why does any organization need 1,400 plus members of their board of directors? No one's been able to explain that to me. Um, as an organization outside of New York City, 99% of all agents are members of NAR. 
It's the only trade association that you're required to be a member of. 17% of doctors are members of the American Medical Association. 15% of lawyers are members of the American Bar Association, but 99% of agents are members of NAR. Because we're required to be. I mean, out here in right, Connecticut, but- it's a requirement to get access to our MLS. And you said that's not the case in New York City. Is it not the case in any of the other major markets where they're so not part of this, the NAR umbrella? This is a big change that's going to come. And just just last night, uh, uh, Realtrax, which is the MLS provider for uh, Tennessee or a large chunk of Tennessee, announced, I think, starting starting in 2025, um, non-realtors will be able to access the MLS, which means I don't need to pay my realtor fee. I can just pay to join the MLS. So this is the bifurcation that I think is going to happen across the country that may lead to the demise or the uh, the the diminishment uh, of NAR because not 99% of those folks want to be members. Um, when polled, 85% said they didn't want to be a member. But begs so, the question, why do we need any organization at all? If Tennessee has decided, well, we don't need an, uh, the umbrella organization, we're going to do we're going to allow anybody to be a member. Why do I need? Uh, well, a, a, we a, want we're incentivized to have a, a trade association as an industry when it comes to advocating for federal policy, state policy, uh, local government. Um, there are so many issues uh, that are at, around the country that. Uh, we need to be involved in right now. Real estate is such an important force in the American economy. To not have a trade association advocating for us would be a great mistake. And so, um, and so that's so, why we think it's so important to have an association. But but is it is it uh, is this a role for one entity or for? I mean, are you like the live golf of you know real estate? You know, like you're coming in with a brand new concept and idea, and it's taking off completely, bending, warping what we've known like i as far as nars concerned i could care less i don't even think about it because we're in manhattan but um that's why i was curious is how you got how you even cared and then the fact that you were in florida makes sense yeah listen i don't i don't know if, i understand the live golf analogy as flawed as i think it probably has but uh, <laughs> but if the saudis want to invest they can they know how to reach me um but um i think that um there's no rule that says you have to have one national trade association in this country. You could have two, you could have 20. We've just been dominated by one for uh, over a hundred years. And so if I had come to you a year ago and said, I want to start a new trade association that may rival the National Association of Realtors, you would say I'm crazy and I'm wasting my time. But now you just say I'm crazy. <laughs> Definitely not wasting my time. And, and I can see that in, we haven't spent, so, so we announced, Mauricio Yamansky and I announced in January, our original, original, original plan was to announce in like June. So in theory, would, no one would even know about it yet. We'd just be like doing all the behind the scenes stuff. But in December, we met and realized that between January and June, there was likely to be seismic changes in the industry. I didn't know exactly. I didn't know if it was going to be a settlement or the the judge's uh, final ruling if they didn't settle or something else. Um, But we bet that there were going to be further agitations in the industry and we wanted to get ahead of it. And we also, just from uh, building a, a new venture, we knew that we're not smart enough that we're the only people thinking of this. And we figured there were other folks percolating and so we announced first, obviously, we made a very big splash in the New York Times. And and since then, there was a poll done, and now it's like six weeks old. So the numbers are higher now. 40% of the industry has heard about the American Real Estate Association, and 27% of the industry is considering joining. This is a poll that was conducted by Inman. Now, the reason that's fascinating is- Is that we have before not... Burroughs and Burbs promoted this show? Yes, well, that's that forty percent penetration. That was because it too. I, we did send out a lot but of emails. What I find, well, that's amazing. What I find is that we haven't spent a dollar, like we don't even like not a dollar on customer acquisition, marketing, branding, anything. And forty percent of the industry, we've penetrated that much. If forty percent of the industry knows about us already, without spending a dime. So imagine what our growth is going to look like when we actually try and invest 
in customer acquisition. We're going to grow significantly. And by the way, we're not even ready for that yet. So, you know, we've had the, everyone who's joined us, it's over 4,000. I don't even track the dailies because it's not that important, but I know it's over 4,000 members by now. But they've just enrolled with us. We haven't um, reached out to them. Like they've come to us all organically, 4,000. Once we start meeting with the, the firms, we have meetings soon where we'll be, we're hoping we'll get like firm-wide enrollments and joining, um, that number will grow significantly. And um, we just haven't been ready for it yet. There's a lot to do when you're starting a new trade association. And we've, we've invested the time uh, with our lawyers and, and accounting and financials. And, you know, we've been very busy on, on the back of the house stuff, let's call it the last few months. But at the same token, we've been very visible in the marketplace. I mean, like, you know, I, I said to you, like, I mean, I was, I was very happy to, you know, to, to come on, on your program. You know, I, I'm not able to do most of the requests because they just, we just be doing, you know, interviews, you know, all, you know, we've doing multiple a day. It's just not, it's just not feasible for the schedule. But um, so instead I just, it's one a week max. So, um, but we're, now, we're since really you announced in January, a lot's happened. So there was a bombshell in January. You announced as a response to the losing of the lawsuit. Since then, a, a settlement was proposed and several of the major firms have uh, also made settlements. So the main issue, and tell me if I'm wrong, is one about buyer's agent, the role of the buyer's agent. So my first question is, do you have... Uh, uh, do you have a different response to the role of the buyer's agent in the market than what we've heard from NAR? And so I first, think we should probably yeah. define what what have what has their thinking evolved to, and how is it different from yours? I believe in this settlement, they made a Faustian bargain with the plaintiffs, and they were in self survival mode. And they did what was best for the survival of the trade association, but not necessarily what was best for the industry, particularly the larger firms who had to, you know, had to fend for themselves and then come up with their own settlements. Uh, otherwise, they'd be subject to massive penalties per the, per the agreement. So first, there was this Faustian bargain. Second, when it comes to the, the buy agreements, we're all now trying to figure out, this is all uncharted. There's going to be a lot of trial by error and, and trial error experimentation. Um, you know, Zillow announced what, what they did yesterday with these touring agreements. Um, no one knows what's going to work and what's not going to work because we've never had to engage the buyer like this before. And every buyer is going to be a little different. Every buyer in different markets are going to be a little different. It's going to be a little uncomfortable out there until we settle down and figure this all out together. Um, because this is so, so different. But it's, so, so it seems to me like right now, there's actually not necessarily, you don't necessarily have an agenda, a platform, et cetera. You're just like, let's stop this rotten apple and <laughs> let's shift to some new thinking, new management, make it cleaner, make it more efficient. And, and then we can start to really think about what our industry really needs as a collective without all of this, you know, th this mountain of, of bureaucracy that's what it's been. Uh, it's a little bit of that, but we have delved into policy already, trying to fix one of the mistakes, uh, one of the shortcomings of this settlement. And one of the shortcomings of this settlement uh, is that, let's look at veterans, for example. So the VA loan guarantee program specifically prohibits buyers from financing the cost of their agent, or even sellers for that matter. So... We're about to have a situation where the veterans of this country who through the loan guarantee program, one of the most successful federal government programs out there we have, by the way, are about to be disenfranchised from the program because if they have to pay for their own agent, the VA program specifically prohibits it. So that means they'll either have to go on their own and risk being, you know, getting their clock clean negotiation. We disenfranchise them and they don't buy in the market. Um or they go on their own, they they get to, they they lose out in negotiation. So, um, so we we've sent letters to the VA. We've been in communication with the House Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance. 
Um, we're proposing hearings in Congress right now because the fix for this is complicated. It would be probably both regulatory and statutory, which in Washington speak is a whole lot of changes to laws and procedures. So, um, but we are working on that. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to testify before Congress on this uh, in, in short order. And so um, I do think there are going to be these latent consequences of the settlement that are potentially very harmful for buyers. And I think we should be protecting the veterans of this country as much as possible. And this agreement does not protect them. So, um, so that's something that, uh, that we're working on now. Again, these are early days. So it, yeah, are we out there on every single policy issue right now? No, because we just like, we, we can't be. We will in time as we grow. Um, but I thought this was an important place to start. Um, I, well, there are two things that were important to start. This was important. And then also, and this was awkward for me being a, a Democratic activist, I did create a video a few weeks ago where I was critical of President Biden, um, who called on his words where he called on realtors to lower commissions, um, which we that would be a cartel. If we can't raise commissions together, we can't lower them together. Um, and I think um, there's this weird misconception about and maybe it comes from TV. I'm not sure about the agents are these like very rich, su like successful group as a as a as a group. And around the country, the average income is fifty six thousand dollars a year. That's twenty thousand below the median income in this country. Um, so calling on people who aren't making above the median income to make less, I don't think is a winning argument to make right now. And and so um, I thought it was important that I come out as a Democrat and say that and be uh, above uh, above party and look at the best interests of the industry be it that makes me critical of a uh, Democrat or Republican, uh, I have to call balls and strikes as I see them. And so so we are working on some policy issues too as we as we ramp everything up. Um, we had a call earlier today with our, our board and about our education platform that we're building. And that won't, it'll be a while. That won't be ready till next year, but I think- How many some, people are on your board? Uh, 1,300 and- <laughs> no, Three, <laughs> three, <laughs> three. Cases, you know, a little smaller, yeah. Okay. You know, Roberto sold a forty-one million dollar townhouse in New York, and I keep reading in the papers that he got paid six percent on that. So I'm doing the math, and I'm thinking, yeah, like like President Biden, that Roberto, if he's typical of the New York agent, he's killing it, right, Roberto? Right. We're yeah, all I'm getting six percent, aren't we? Right. All getting six. I'll get in six. So Ask Jason about his 70 million asset. What percentage was that? <laughs> Not six. <laughs> Way less than six on that sale. Way so in all seriousness, so once again, I think the power rests in the MLS. Really, it's the MLS, in my, and, and in my case, it's Smart MLS or the New Canaan MLS or the Darien MLS. I can join one of them, but they set the rules. Okay, They're the ones who dictate that you've got to... Um, provide a, a level playing field and but, the way but they hold do on that... hold on you made a re just made a really interesting point though okay okay who, who licensed you in the state of connecticut call uh the state. the state the state okay 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 the state just like in new york the state license okay you just named four different mls's right you're licensed by the state but can you do business in darien unless you're a member of the mls I can. I can do I can do business anywhere in the state of Connecticut because I'm licensed by the state. You're licensed by the state. Do you have access to the MLSs? No. Okay, so <laughs> I do not have access to but that's the my point. MLS unless I pay them. Or but the that's Darien my point. Enrollment. So you have to join four. I know people who are members of eight MLSs. That's the highest I've seen so far. I've a, a bunch of people at six. I know one guy in California who's a member of eight MLSs. To me, the MLS system is a restraint of trade. You're licensed by the state. You should be able to do business in the state and not have to join 96 MLSs to do your business. I, I grew up on Long Island. I should be able to, I can sell in Jericho, Long Island, just as well as anyone or the Hamptons that I know very well, but I got to join. Now it's not LIBOR anymore, but whatever the new, whatever the, the name is now. Like I, like I feel like I should be able to sell in a state where I'm licensed because the state licensed me not a not an MLS. And so I don't like this idea that I have to pay multiple MLSs to do business on an even keel in the state. I should have access to the data of the state. Who's going to pay for that though? The New Canaan MLS collects money from the, its its members to provide a service. 
Right. I th I think the MLS system is going to be reformed. Probably with the new Canaan and Greenwich and Darien, ML the smaller MLSs perhaps going away, and the large the 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 halves will get bigger. The big ones will get bigger, and the small ones may go away. And, and that I mean that might that might happen. We might see we might see national platforms come out. Um, there may be other solutions. State so how solutions. would how would that work? How would a national platform work? that everybody would have to subscribe to. I mean, like all of these little ones would then subscribe to that. And it's just, and it's just a sharing platform. Potentially. I think there are a number of ways. Can, I think like one of the problems, you know how many MLSs there are in this country? Like something like 800. But the problem is with APIs and innovation, like most, not all, most MLSs, the UX, the interface is ridiculous. Like I, if I showed you the MLS of, that I in 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 South Florida and book that's used in Palm Beach County, I would never send that to a client. It's like it's like 1997. Like it's a joke. Lots of MLSs around the country are really dated, and I did a little research on this as to why they're dated. It's because uh, technology providers have all these systems are different. So like you got to come up with like 600 different like systems to fit all the different MLSs. So we're stifling innovation in the industry because we're so disintermediated with all these systems. I got to push back and say that some people watching this will say, well, if those MLSs go away, then Zillow and Realtor will take their place. Or homes.com has very famously bought a few Super Bowl ads and is trying to do that. Yeah, try, trying to do that very thing, trying to become a national platform at the expense of the now, I'm going to say crippled MLSs. That's right. Crippled because they no longer have a very powerful NAR, um, you know, telling them what to do and watching their back. We're not aggregators and we are the vanguards of the data in our industry and we have to get our act together and we have to do something that would combat what you just said. But the way we're doing it now ain't working and it's going to and it's going to get worse. So at some point, someone has to come in and say, how do you create more innovation in the MLSs? How do you make them more user friendly? How do you make them more scalable? How do you make them more accessible? And stop with this bullshit of 800 different systems around the country that don't talk to each other in large cases. And and you and you can't grow anything proper on the platforms. I mean, has anyone spent time looking at different MLSs? And again, Houston has a great one, by the way. So I'm going to exclude. There are some like Har is phenomenal, and there are some that completely ignore from what I'm, I'm saying here. But there are a lot that are pathetic, and they're hurting our industry. And we so have the, to change this. So the questions are coming in in the chat, which is so why is uh, area? Uh, or American Re going to fix that? How are you different from? No, we've got a broken system. Got to got to understand why this is going to get better yeah. with your trade association. Well, I don't. We don't own any MLSs. I mean, we don't like. There are state associations are the biggest shareholders of the MLSs in this country. We're going to have an entirely different different system. We we I I I don't know. We don't know what the answer is just yet. But I know that the current system is untenable and is leading to the aggregators taking over. And unless we start to figure out how to provide better data for our colleagues and the, and the public, uh, we're going to lose. But so it's it seems like you need private sector level money mm -hmm. to yeah. do it. Yeah. But essentially it's private level sector. Isn't that the Zillows and et cetera as well? So how do you... How do you govern that? Like who's in, con who, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's beyond, above my pay grade. So that's why I guess why I'm asking, like, how, what's the solution? How, how do you merge that? How do you make it work? Yeah. So the answer is, is innovation. It's to honestly, it's to, uh, and this is outside of our work in the trade association, but I do believe that you'll see, um, you're going to see innovators come in, in the industry and, you know, I've, I've been meeting with a lot of them. I think there's some really good ideas out there that are sort of being baited right now and we'll see and incubated. Um, 
but I think I think that the whole system and it doesn't mean that MLSs go away. I, I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that that um, what we're doing isn't working. We're handing over our, our business to aggregators and we're going to start paying them for our own business, and our, you know, our own buyers and soup to nuts. So um, I think I think we can be a part of helping because I don't think I don't think NAR was helping uh, them with innovation because take take a look at the product. Um, I, I have yet to meet anyone outside of the the five really good. Well, there's a little more than that over the some of the really good ones that are out there. We're proud of how their their MLS interface and and share it with clients proudly, uh, and like the the tech tools and the innovation. Like we're just so behind. We've always been so behind as an industry. Um, I think the lawsuit. I think the lawsuit and and the major issue in the lawsuit was the compensation model had to evolve. And NAR, in its arrogance, said no. Um, first, when challenged, they said no. Um, the, uh, buy, buyer's agent will be listed. Compensation will be listed, and it will not be zero. And then when they lost a few rounds in the lawsuits, they said, fine, it can be zero. And now in the latest iteration, it will be eliminated from the MLS yeah. as a line item, there will not be any uniform uh, promise of buyer's agent compensation. It's got everybody in the industry wondering what's going to fill that void. How are we going to do this if we don't have a uniform policy? I think it's the opportunity you have is to answer how you would evolve, how you would evolve on this question, reform on this question, solve this and yet the Justice Department has said, we don't want a uniform solution. We want buyer's agents to get paid based on the value they provide, and certainly not by the seller's agent or by the seller. Yeah, and we'll so, find out soon from DOJ what we, what if they, if they want to get further into this. Uh, so it really into- seems like a three-way question. Department of Justice has an opinion, NAR has an opinion, and for you have an opportunity to come in with a differing opinion to differentiate yourself as being different from NAR. And so it's I'm very interested in, in how your thinking has evolved on the question of the buyer's agent, given the framework that DOJ has provided us, which is it can't be the way it used to be, and it can't be from the seller. But I, I think the problem with sometimes when government puts themselves into market into markets and they try to regulate them we've seen the problems that that can create and i worry here that the government's coming in by the way we saw this in new york in the 2019 rent laws great intent right we're going to lower rents let's do it and they created 2019 rent laws and what happened the rents immediately went down for like 2 weeks the new york times did a victory lap in their now famous editorial where they said you did it new york we've lowered the rents here we are today Rents have never been higher. Inventory has been destroyed. There are over 50,000 units sitting off the market. And we've gotten, uh, the, the didn't work as intended. And so that's, that again, that's my worry about when, when government steps in uh, into a market. We're actually working on some, some New York ideas that uh, I'll be able to share soon to, I think, alleviate, to get some of those vacant units back onto the market. But um uh, it's it's that's my that's my fear is the unintended consequence of uh, government stepping in and then disenfranchising buyers like, OK, you're going to say buyers, you have to pay if government's going to say buyers have to pay their agent. But they're not going to provide relief in the form of allowing that cost to be financed, which right now veterans can't do. If you get an FHA back loan, you can't do if you get a conforming loan. You can't do because it won't conform to Fannie's guidelines. You can't; they can't sell in the secondary market, so it's only going to be private lenders. So, it's easy for government to come in and say, "Okay, here's how it's going to be," with but then you have to change X, Y, and Z along the way too. So I worry that it makes it more messy, and and I think that we have the chops to go out there into the market to the media and have these conversations because the media isn't, they're not real estate experts. They don't know. And so it's our job at the trade association to educate them, which is why I do spend a considerable portion of my day trying to educate uh, or inform reporters of our, of our positions. 
In the original New York Times article, it mentioned something about uh, Mauricio, your partners. Um, it was something about an off-listing database that he had in Los Angeles or something he had created, and he had a grievance. What? Can you just explain that to me? I didn't clearly understand that. Well, he had a private listing service, which uh, NAR sued him over, and he had to shut it down. Um, so um, I and guess why it, it would violated they clear. Let's, I guess it violated stop. clear cooperation in their mind. But can you define clear cooperation? It's not well understood. And I think it really is essential to the question of what is NAR? Where does their power come from? How is their power leveraged over the MLSs? My understanding is they put out a policy, clear cooperation. You must adhere to clear cooperation. These are our rules. And all of the MLSs adopt those rules. That's how NAR uh, affects my life, because my MLS is a clear cooperation MLS. And what you're saying is anytime anybody ever did anything differently, such as private listings, it was in violation of clear cooperation. Right, you're not cooperating on the MLS. With if you have data, it has to go on the MLS. Right. Basically. So yeah, so they shut it down. Okay, and so Maurice thinks that we should be allowed to do things off MLS. We should be able to allowed to innovate and work outside of not outside, not just outside of NAR, but outside of the MLS. I could argue. I could argue in an age of consolidation where some of the largest agencies in the nation have gotten a lot larger in the last decade that um, a, a large agency, your agency, Compass, my agency, Element, is at an, an, an advantage if we're allowed to privately work listings within our large agency, we have an advantage over small agencies. So that if would be if we're trying to be empower, a problem. Right. If we're trying to empower the consumer uh, in this whole process, uh, giving the consumer choice is part of that. And to say, listen, not, if I'm a seller, but I don't want to be in your MLS, I, you sh I shouldn't have to be compelled to do so is the is the counter argument to that. And so, you know, is there space for sellers who don't want to be for whatever reason? It's a crazy world. And they, they feel too exposed on that kind of a network in an MLS. Maybe they want to go a different way. And the question is, should they be allowed to do so or should they be not allowed to do so? I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I find, you know, that we're, a lot of this is about transparency, empowering the buyers, et cetera, right? And there's a certain, the way the system has been, there's a certain baseline of value with, it, with, with property. Something sells, you know that, the, the, the commission was five to 6% or whatever it was. Typically, you know, you have a general rule I'm with appraisers, et cetera. Now we're going to get into a place where did the buyer play that part of the commission? Yeah. Did this, and you're going to have valuation delta of two to 3% where you really don't know the value of something right. really, which that's right. from a transparency is terrible for everybody. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I agree. I, I find that the, I mean, it's a, it's the whole rental thing. They do something that in theory sounds great. And it just, it's just, it has a completely reverse effect. And now we right. have a housing stock that's really degrading because the taxes keep going up, but they can't make the rent. They can't, you know, it's just terrible. So we, that's because we have folks who are not real estate professionals dictating policy for an industry that they don't really understand fully. That's what it is. I still want to come back to this. Why is it a good idea? Why is dismantling clear cooperation a good idea? Because truly, if I go out to LA and you've dismantled clear cooperation and, uh, and word is that if you want access to one of the great properties uh, in, of LA, you've got to call Maurice because Maurice has these pocket listings in his pocket that are only available to Maurice and and his agency, then haven't we really returned to uh, the age of the pocket listing? And by clear cooperation, the intent, right? The exec you can argue with the execution, but the intent of clear cooperation was that Maurice has to make it available to Element and Element has to make it available to Brown Harris Stevens. And we all have to provide a level playing field. And that's what's best for the sellers and the buyers. Yes, so but aren't pocket you dismantling listings that? 
No, because pocket listings of 30 years ago are completely different from pocket listings of today. 30 years ago, you, you would, you know, there would be no mechanism to really display or feature them, whereas there are today. If he wants to put it on a private website or anyone, not, uh, anyone wants to put on a private website and that's where the seller wants to be, um, that's much different than you just got to call this guy and see what he's got, uh, which is, I think was the example you're using, which is how it used to be. You know, there are always those big agents in New York back in the day, like, you know, and they, they were legendary, like, you, you know, they were the, they, they were the vanguards of the, of the data, which isn't but the we're way we're going back to that technology, notwithstanding, if I know when I get to LA, it's not enough to go look at Zillow and realtor.com aggregators of MLS data. I got to go to Maurice.com and see what he's got. And I probably have to call him now that the DOJ has said, uh, he doesn't have to pay a buyer, a buyer's broker. I have to call Maurice for access. Well, probably to a good, probably a good reason. Probably a good reason to uh, probably a good reason to have an agent who's experienced out there, who's a professional, who knows all the listings that are out there, public and private too, right? Good okay. agent's gonna know. Just like John, it's just like Paris. Remember when we did the show in Paris, and also Duke in uh, Saint Bart's, same thing. He's got, he knows them all. And why are we doing this show in step backwards? We should tell Jason what we learned. When we when we did our show on St. Bart's, they have what you're describing. They they said 50% or less than 50% of everything available in St. Bart's is up on the website. If you want to know what's available in St. Bart's, you got to know a guy and like <laughs> like our guest who yeah. knows all the other guys. And so it's a club. It's a club. And he said uh, most of the listings in St. Bart's are not published anywhere. That's like where 70%, we're Like 70%, I think is what he said. 70% of them. Are not. Yeah. Right. But I, that's, a, that's a, like a crazy high-end. That's a very niche market. We would never see John, anything. John, don't worry. We know the guy. Yeah, you know the guy. You'd never see anything like that in this country. You know, well, I, 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 I could I'm make sitting, the argument. I'm sitting here in Fairfield County where we've got 56 listings in New Canaan, a market they used to have. 250 to 350 of those 56 are very precious. And if you know that five agents have all 50 listings and you have to call them, then not only is NAR got no power, the MLS has lost power and your trade association will also cease to be relevant if we've gone backwards to where a few top agents and agencies hold all the cards. I think our trade association is going to earn its chops on policy and on legislative wins um, and on the education platform that we're going to build and some of the other tools that we have in development. Um, I think that the the data of this industry is going to evolve how it's going to evolve, but I think it's going to change dramatically for the good and bad, maybe. Mostly, I think, for the good, though. So talk through some of the specifics on how, for instance, what you know, what are some of the needs of realtors? You talked about education. Uh, what are the needs of realtors that uh, your trade association is going to so address? One of the first things we're going to work on, and this is a little counterintuitive for a trade association, we think there should be less agents. We think there are too many. In 1978, the average agent did 12.2 deals a year, 1978. 2022, the last time this data, same data was available, the average agent did 7.8 deals a year. Why? With all the efficiencies, email, social, texts, fax machines, whatever, since 1978, why is it that all these technological advantages make us do less deals than then? Shouldn't we be doing more? The answer is there are five times as many agents as there were in 1978. So we think that there are too many out there for too little deals and that the industry would be better served by an industry of true professionals like, like yourselves and not people who do it because they watch a TikTok video and think that they can make a million dollars uh, selling luxury real estate or What's everyone. What's the mechanism to contract those numbers? So the mechanism to contract those numbers is state by state changing the, uh, the admission requirements, the licensure requirements, both for continuing education and for admission to the industry. We think that states, and we're going to be advocating in 2025 for the states to be raising their educational <laughs> standards, um, making the exams more challenging, making the requirements more difficult. 
<clears throat> making the continuing education different. Uh, and I think that we can start to reduce agent count, which is so counterintuitive for a trade association because it means we're smaller. Uh, NAR won, NAR got bigger on the backs of everyone because it was everyone was joining and everyone was paying them dues, right? So NAR benefited from this low barrier to entry where everyone became an agent. But the agents that they represented lost. There is no reason why today we should be doing less deals than we did in 1978, except for the fact that our trade association benefited from that growth. So we want to elevate the industry through higher standards on licensure. And then also we're building out a new education platform that I think will be really interesting uh, to agents, not just for CE credits, but also just to, to elevate their standards. Part of our bargain with agents our trade association will always be optional to join. Uh, even if your firm enrolls you, uh, you can you can leave or you can not renew the next year if you wish. But the whole idea is uh, that we're going to ask we're going to ask you to elevate the industry. And if this isn't for you, you should leave. And, uh, and that means we'll be asking you to take some courses with us. They won't not necessarily for for cost, but just because we want we want to get the best of the best. And we think that's better for the American consumer too. All right. Bravo. I want to uh, show the screen, jasonhaber.com. I mean, in addition to going to AmericanREA.org, you can also find out more about Jason Haber. I got and, a plug for the book. <laughs> and a plug for the book at jasonhaber.com. But in our last minute, you know, I just wanted to express my sincere gratitude to Jason for joining us today and talking about this really important issue. I've never in the, all my career uh, seen so much anxiety among agents over the future of uh, our business and all this change. Huge amount of anxiety. So I have to applaud you for coming on the show, talking us through these changes. Um, if you love everything about real estate the way Roberto and I love, then please share the word, like it, subscribe to it. Please come back, tell all your friends to tune in to Burrows and Burbs every day, three o'clock. And um, I guess- Thank Roberto, you for having me on. If you're interested, visit AmericanRIA.org. Sign up there. There's no cost. 2024 and uh, you won't get any spam from us. We won't never sell your data to healthcare providers or whatever the hell they do with the data. Jason there. hats off to you for, for really for stepping in and doing this. Cause you're, you're really doing it for everybody. And that's a, that's a, I mean, it's your time, it's your expertise. And uh, I, I can't imagine, I mean, I, I could, I would never be able to do it. So I, I'm thank you for that. It's amazing. No, thank you. It's um, it wasn't again. It wasn't planned. It's just how everything sort of unfolded, and um, I got and... I got a hard question for you as we as we got one more minute. Yeah. How is this for business? I gotta think that you sticking your finger in the chest of NAR and my local MLS, and oh by the way, in your spare time, sticking your finger in Joe Biden's chest and saying, "Now wait a minute here." I mean, is this good for business? Getting political. No. Okay. No. Is his videos book are sales? Good. You should see uh, his, his videos. His videos are amazing. They're movies. Yeah. <laughs> They're movies. But, uh, you know, we, we never know what comes of all this and how it all plays out. So I, I just think in being your authentic self and the rest sort of takes care of itself. So it's just me being, being me. Well, awesome. thank you so much for being you, your Jason. authentic thank self you. with us today. And I, I wish you every success in New York. It's tough on an ordinary day, but even tougher when you stick your neck out. So yeah, thank you for, for sure. all you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me today. Cheers, man. Thank you so and much. Thank you, thank Roberto. You. And see you next week. Good to see you, Skipper. Cheers.